Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we welcome back to the show one of our most popular returning guests, Mitch Horowitz. Mitch is an historian, speaker, public intellectual, editor, and author. He joins us today to talk about his latest book, Miracle Habits, The Secret of Turning Your Moments into Miracles. We talk about focus, vitality, how best to use money, the destructive power of gossip, among many other topics. There's even a bit about Tucker Carlson in there. Enjoy. Mitch, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Congratulations on the new book. Uh, it seems when I message you about it, uh, it seems very timely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how long did how long did you spend writing it? I know there's some moments in there where you're talking about um, the book is kind of finishing up around April of this year. So some of the events that have hijacked 2020 must have weighed in on it. But uh, but I don't know. It seems like it's come out at quite the right time. Yes, the, 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 the events of 2020 and the events by which we're going to define our generation crept in just at the end of the writing. You know, I was really writing this book at the end of uh, the previous year, beginning of 2020, going into the spring. And back in January, here in New York City, in this particular quarter of the world, we were still in complete denial about the COVID crisis the impending lockdown, the economic collapse, and so on. Everything felt falsely normal at that time. Of course, many people just had no way of knowing. And I was writing the book at a very feverish, busy pace in, uh, say, the first uh, uh, few months of 2020. And then the COVID crisis really began to hit in earnest towards the end of the stretch of time I was writing and I got COVID. I got sick. I had COVID for about eight weeks and it was a relatively mild case. It's very individualized, but in certain cases, it really gets its claws into you. That was the case for me. So unexpectedly, I had two intensive months to sit at home in my apartment on the Lower East Side, refining, embellishing, reconsidering what I had written in light of the COVID epidemic. And if it's timely, it's timely by the happenstance of our having entered a period while I was writing this book where everything that we knew, every reference point, every plan that we had made was pulled out from under us. And suddenly we all find ourselves in a position of having to assert things in our lives that perhaps had been in the background and that now must come to the forefront because familiar things that we've relied upon, like getting up and going to work in the morning are completely vanished. Yeah, uh, it has. I know this phrase has been used a lot in media the last few months. It's, a number of the habits have like a now more than ever feel uh, about them, but it's almost like it's even a now or never feel <laughs> to it, them. It, it really is. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, unfortunately, as you and I are speaking, or maybe fortunately, depending upon one's perspective, the full brunt of this, I believe, at least economically, has not really hit us yet. We, you know, we in New York, for example, and in certain other parts of the United States, certain other parts of the world, you know, we're still able to survive off of fumes from the old world. We've taken very serious economic hits, but we're surviving off of fumes. And those fumes are going to go away into August and September. What replaces them, we don't know. And I would never speak in a trite, or sing song way about any of this, you know, talking about reinventing yourself or, you know, uh, uh, remaking yourself. I mean, yes, that, that, that's true enough, but those things are not specific enough. They're not tough enough. They're not, they're not hard enough. I could name any number of things that I'm doing right now in the here and now 
to alter and change my life to address new realities. But let me tell you, I would never mislead you or your listeners for a second. You know, here in the United States, uh, health insurance, I don't need to tell most of you listening, is a total debacle. I don't have health insurance right now. I'm walking around without health insurance. My kids have health insurance, but uh, I can't pay premiums that are jiggered up by companies who do everything possible to deny you every legitimate benefit. And I say this as a person of steely-eyed realism. I know full well what the risks are. I'm not myopic about any of this for a moment. And yet, you know, this is part of the world that we're dealing with. And I'm being straightforward about this only because there's millions of people around the world. There's many people among your listeners who are dealing with this very same thing. And the last thing they need to do is hear from some uh, you know, practical spirituality writer, some self-help writer who's going to paint a picture for them of uh, his own life uh, that's not uh, absolutely dead to rights, real and authentic. At the same time, there's lots of wonderful things happening in my life that I'm absolutely thrilled about that I feel have grown uh, out of the practical spiritual path that I write about and that I endorse for other people. So I'm trying to give people the real story because these are tough times we live in and this is, this is no time for anybody's fantasies or posturing. No, and, and I think there's a, um, well, I'll, well, I'll get you to boil the book down to a sentence in a minute, but it, it obviously goes uh, along or flies beside uh, a previous book, well, several of them, like uh, Miracle Club, right? Yes. And this one, this one seems and i mean this is a compliment more stringent do you know what i mean yes yes <laughs> that now or never feel miracle club had to do a couple of things which is sort of explain that these um new thought inspired techniques have uh have science and efficacy behind them and, and, and had to kind of like lay the scene and, and set it out in a very, and, and it succeeded in doing so very welcoming uh and invitational way miracle habits is more like now it's time to do these things. It's that literally now and right. there's a stringency to it. I appreciate that. And there absolutely is a stringency to it. And I suppose my operating principle when I wrote the book was to come to terms with the fact that our, I, I, I mean, you asked me to boil the book down to a sentence. I could say imagination is destiny, for example, and I believe that, and I practice that, and I live by that. But the truth is so much gets in the way of our capacity to tell ourselves the story about life that we wish to, to enter into the feeling state that I believe is the royal road to mind causation that we wish to. So much of our lives consist of the routine day in, day out behaviors that we engage in for good or ill. So I decided to come up with 13 habits that I felt would do the job for us, so to speak. They're stringent, but they're not impossible. Since our lives are made up of routine, I had to address myself to the question of, well, what are my routines? What are my routines? And the thing I really feel proud of in this book is that these are tough habits, but they're altogether real. They're just dead to rights real. And they're things that are within the reach of the individual. Yeah, they are. And, and some of them, it's funny, like, um, I think some of them might be a push. They might be, uh, okay, well, this is going to be harder than my normal operating or my, you know, however we say it, normal operating way of being in the world. But some yes. of them, some of them are in a funny way, easier, or at least like, well, actually you can drop all that. So like get away from cruel people. <laughs> yes. <right? laughs> you just hit on my favorite one. That was the very example I was going to bring up. That's habit number six, get away from cruel people. That was the example I was going to bring up. You know, there is a crisis in our world that none of us can talk about. None of us are given cultural space to talk about. And that is the problem of human cruelty on an intimate level. Virtually everyone you talk to can tell you stories, real stories, serious, dead to rights, mature stories of friends, so-called loved ones, coworkers, mates, people they're dating, whomever, who have been absolutely cruel to them, passive aggressive, gaslighting, insulting, cut them down. And we don't realize that we can completely turn off the spigot. We can cut these people out of our lives completely and totally. We're falsely conditioned to believe that the consequences are greater than we can bear. And that's not true. That's simply not true. I tell a story in the book of uh, a woman here in New York City 
who during a blackout here in New York back in 2012, had a son, a young son, who was running a very high, dangerous fever. And she lived in a high-rise building where the elevator wasn't working, she couldn't go in and out to get groceries. So she went to stay with her in-laws on Long Island who lived in a luxury high-rise building and they had power. And her in-laws, her mother-in-law in particular, was horrible to her, could not have been less welcoming. And this person telling me the story, she was a neighbor, family friend, person I've known for a while, mature person, decent person. And I said to her, you know, you've been complaining about your mother-in-law for years about how cruel she is, about how hostile she is, about how unwelcoming she makes you feel. Well, why don't you just refuse to see her? Why don't you just cut her out of your life? And she said, well, you know, I want my son to have positive adults in his life. And I said, well, you know, he has positive adults in his life. This isn't one of them. And I didn't want to push the point with her further because I felt it wasn't my personal business. But what I want to communicate to everybody is never tell yourself you can't. You can. And I can say to you, I can represent to you from the experience of my own life, which I can't imagine is exceptional, that I have cut cruel people out of my existence thinking that the consequences would be grave. They're not. You wake up the next morning whistling whistling and you'd be amazed how low key the consequences really are so that's that's one of the 13 habits yeah and it's i really like it and i think people need to i don't know it, it's a cultural thing we're, we're sort of we grew up in a whether you're christian or not you grow up in a framework of sort of hair shirt mystics and, and so on but one of the points you make i think it's in that chapter is sort of more important than analyzing or understanding hostility is the getting away from it like in a way it's a luxury to go well why did why did my mother what happened in her childhood that made her so toxic towards me and you could tell it's like without knowing this woman you know it has to do with she's jealous of the son's affection for the wife sure, sure. And, but like who cares get away from who it who cares yeah. amen you know, I always tell people to look for, look for the effect that something is having, and you'll, you'll understand the motive. You know, look for the effect. You know, the fact is, all of us have tragedy in our lives. All of us have trauma in our lives. I mean, look, we've got people in our world who are refugees from war. You know, we've got people fleeing civil wars in Yemen, in Syria. I mean, these people have dealt with horrible life and death burdens that most of us uh, at least speaking for those of us who live in the West, as I do, you know, don't have not known. So the fact is every one of us has traumas that doesn't give a people license to be hostile to or violent towards other people. So I, you know, another one of the points of the book is that is maintaining a certain honorable speech, a certain degree of honor in your speech, because I have found that people who complain about being victimized almost always are the worst gossips among us, the worst tail bearers among us, the, the worst rock throwers among us. And one must be very, very careful of that. The manner in which people use cries of victimization to do acts of violence against other people, not always physical violence, sometimes emotional violence, is appalling. And you know, people are always telling me they're anxious, they're depressed, they feel this low-level anxiety following them around. What can they do? Their shrink can't do anything about it. Their friends are t tired of listening to them. And I tell them, and I mean this with deepest seriousness, stop gossiping, stop trash talking about other people, stop running down other people's reputations on an intimate level, and stop listening to such things, because those things degrade us, they deplete us. And I mean that as a physical reality. Anybody who spent an hour gossiping has probably had the experience of feeling physically spent. Yeah. Don't ignore that. You know, it's real. Pay attention to it. It's one thing the individual can do. Try it for 24 hours to see if you don't stand taller. I guarantee that you will. Absolutely. You find that in holy books. You find that in, in animist cultures around the world that because yes. in some sense, you know, your words and your attention have power. That's why things like new thought, quote unquote, work. Yes. If you, if you direct your attention to that kind of like um, unnecessary nastiness and, and cruelty, yes. you're not, you're not like yelling down a tyrant. You're just being like, I can swear on my show. You're just being a cunt. Um, yes, absolutely. See, that's that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like there's a it's funny because it kind of goes in with the um 
not just getting away from hostile people, but say, okay, so this is one half of a kind of wider miracle habit, which is like, I am going to take my words and my thoughts seriously. And that means I'm not going to gossip. And, and I'm also going to protect myself from it. So that's the Napoleon Hill references in there. Like you have to protect yourself from the random opinion of others. Like it, yes. it, from a magic perspective, it will, it, like it steals your energy. <laughs> yes, it, it, it really does. You know, I used to, when I was first studying the occult uh, back when I was a kid, I would always come across these statements about the occult power of silence and so on. And it all sounded very dramatic to me, but it's, it's very practical. Other people are just waiting to steal our energy and they really do. And when we say energy, you know, that can sound metaphorical, that can sound indirect, but I, I mean it in, in, with, with, with absolute solidity, you know, in, in the miracle club, I attempt to come up with a theory of mind causation. It may be wrong, but my attempt is to talk about the manner in which we select events in which our perspective or our senses are kind of uh, technology of measurement in a certain way. I feel absolutely certain as I do that we select events that we do have a certain finite amount of energy. And I'm going to try to get much more specific about that in future writings, but I, I mean it with absolute literalness that when we listen to or participate in the denigration of other individuals, which most of the time has nothing to do with justice, it's just the titillation derived from attacking another person, uh, we deplete ourselves. We absolutely deplete ourselves. And I think in some auto-suggestive way, we also condition the same traits within ourselves. There's just no way to win. You have mm -hmm. to stop gossiping and, and good things will accrue to you very quickly. Yeah, we're doing, um, it's, it's an Australian thing, we're doing dry July down here. And um, as part of, as I mentioned before we hit record, I'm living in the guest house because this place is a, is an icy mess of, of carpet and paint and whatever at the moment. <laughs> so we're like, okay, well, let's just go all in. Let's let, have like an austere, we're doing dry July and, and all the rest of it. And part of that is a, uh, I've limited myself to four minutes of Twitter a day. Wow. And, uh, my mind has cleared up like I have come off um, some sort of dodgy prescription medication. And it's that like, Twitter is the perfect platform. Like we've all been in a Twitter pile on or something and you think this is not, and when you step away from it, you have more coherence and energy. And, and it's fascinating to think that um, there is a real effect uh, of your coherence in, in doing this. And I noticed that I saw it was a couple of days ago on my four minutes on Twitter that you said, you're like, that's it. I'm not talking about politics on Twitter yes. anymore. And, yes. and I get it. I mean, it, it, it only makes the world worse, even if the statement that you are making comes from like a, a righteous and caring place. It's just making the world worse. Do you know what I mean? It, 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 does, it, it really does make the world worse. And it's interesting, you know, there's an expression that makes the rounds, Twitter isn't real life. And I, I, part, I break with that. I, I reject that. Twitter is real life in the sense that most of us, we spend enormous amounts of time on Twitter. There are measurable physical effects that arise from all the bickering and the sarcasm and the rhetorical questions that populate Twitter. Twitter makes people more angry at one another. It monetizes contest, anger, sarcasm. And uh, Twitter, as far as I'm concerned, is, is, is as, as real as it gets. You know, many of us here in New York City have been sitting in our apartments wearing masks for the past four months, and we're spending plenty of time on Twitter. And I just came to realize that what you said is correct. Tweeting about politics makes things worse. I don't know what I'm going to replace it with. I have my point of view. I have my outlook on the world. Uh, I plan to vote. I, I engage in discussions now and then with people. But I'm not remotely convinced that, that Twitter accomplishes anything politically any more than defaming people's reputations accomplishes anything politically. I'm not sure more justice results from that. And uh, I, I, I think that it's, it's, it's a poison. It's a smog. Uh, it's, it's, it's no one's fault in particular, but the social media companies have found ways to monetize conflict. And if you're tweeting about politics, it's overwhelmingly likely you're participating in that. It's absolutely, it's like, um, oh my God, I saw, I just, speaking of um, 
Western health outcomes in the supermarket the other day, I saw Mountain Dew flavored Doritos. And, um, <laughs> what a and that, that, <laughs> but that's like, um, if you, if you want to understand what, why certain countries have higher death counts than others, that sort of hyper palatable carcinogen is yes. what, right? Yes. Now, Twitter, it's it's the same thing. It is designed. It's not anybody's fault, but from an engagement perspective, it's designed around a sort of psychological hyperpalatability, which means it will optimize to be bad for you. <laughs> yes, yes, it's a, it's it, absolutely true. And it, as we all know, these adrenal rushes they, they are addictive. Dopamine, adrenaline. All these enzymes are addictive and they have a place. They have a purpose. When I see a bear on the road, I want to have an adrenal rush and it helps me, but I can't have that every time, you know, somebody's making, asking a rhetorical question. But apropos of the Mountain Dew flavored Doritos, you know, there's a chapter on physical, uh, on physical vitality in the book. And I, I was struck by two things that two different people told me who have been colleagues of mine on the path. One was Mike Murphy, the co-founder of the Esalen Institute. And he was telling me several years ago, he has a friend who's a shrink. And when people come to him and they complain of depression or anxiety, as most patients do, he has them go away for a month and jog or bicycle, do some exercise, maybe some weightlifting or something like that, and see if that doesn't help. And a majority of the times, certainly not all the time, but a majority of the times, th that, that results in sufficient relief so that the person no longer feels they need to enter talk therapy or receive script. Mm. And I, I think that I, I'm not a fitness guru, but there's a certain baseline of physical care that we absolutely must engage in. I'm not dry. You know, I drink and I smoke weed and I indulge in some other things here and there. But one really has to take a look at these things and ask, you know, if you're waking up with headaches, if you're waking up in the morning and you have to pop Advil, if you're being sedentary, that's going to catch up with you. And it's going to catch up with you in a serious way. And if you don't take care of yourself physically now, eventually it's going to take all your attention later. And you don't want to be in that situation. Again, I'm not a fitness guru and, and I'm not dry. But I, I really do feel that we have to take a look at these things in our lives. I do believe that there's some psychological dimension to, uh, to strength training or, or physical activity. It's not just a question of physical appearance. It's, it's, it's important to the, to the tone of our overall system. And I have no problem with alcohol. I have no problem with weed if that's the individual's choice. But you have to really, really be careful if it's making you get up an hour later every morning. Cumulatively, th that's going to that's going to cost you something in years ahead. And I, I really want people to just pay attention to physical vitality. Yeah. Um, the sobriety one's interesting. I saw that it's almost like an extra miracle hack towards the end. Cause you have, which we'll get yep. to a story about Tucker Carlson, but I was yes. kind of laughing along with that last night because I mentioned the dry July thing and what have you. And last year, because of the ayahuasca dietas and so on, there was about but in the before and after the, about a quarter of last year um, was dry as well. And, and so is this month. That's interesting. It's, it's not that I spend, I just want to be clear. I'm not spending every night, like, fall down drunk <laughs> these are like big chunks of time without anything and i was yeah. talking to my um, astrologer friend austin about it because he's always experimenting with different like um vedic astrological rituals that require mm -hmm. different kinds of austerities and there is in in a state of sobriety and it's the tucket story in a minute um yes you get so much more done and it's it's that sounds so like protestant work ethic but it's not there's something about being up late at night reading a book instead of drinking i said this to austin it feels like a, an expensive high it feels like a clean cocaine yes there's, there's something yes. about just having your own mind in a book um, and it's, it's just this really really interesting mode but tell us the tucker story because that was fun oh it's funny i knew tucker carlson back in the mid 1990s and he and i were friendly and we had talked about a book that we wanted to collaborate on together. It never worked out. And we, we, we parted the uh, company just because people go in different directions in life. And, and then, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't caught up with Tucker in many, many, many years, but uh, my older son, 
whose name is Caleb, was watching an interview that Tucker was doing online with the conservative analyst uh, Ben Shapiro. And in just this completely offhanded way, they were talking about something else altogether, but in just this completely offhanded way, Tucker made the remark, uh, um, I decided to stop drinking because I wanted to be more successful. And it worked. And then he just went on with whatever other point he was making. And I thought to myself, well, listen to that. Listen to that. Why shouldn't I take that seriously? It, it presents itself as an obvious truth, but I've never proved it in my personal experience. And this was in January of last year. This was in January of 2019. So again, I'm, I'm not dry, but I had a particular need to make a lot of money at that time in my life. And I had a lot of deadlines that were very important to me. So I decided to stop smoking. I don't smoke today. Uh, stop drinking. Stop uh, alcohol altogether. And it was funny because I was just about to go to, uh, Egypt, uh, with my friend Ronnie Thomas, where we're shooting a documentary. And so, uh, Egypt is, is largely dry anyway, although you can certainly get your hands on alcohol, but I was, I was drinking non-alcoholic beer in Egypt and, uh, I did promote myself the smoking of hookah now and then, which I really enjoy. But by and large, I was completely dry. I was not smoking cigarettes and I was not smoking pot. Long story short, you know, he was correct. Tucker was right. My productivity skyrocketed. Now I haven't stuck with a dry lifestyle, but it is important to know, as you were referencing, as, as you practice, as Austin practices, that, that from time to time, you can be dry. And it is very important, and it does make a difference. And it, it, you will get up earlier, you will work harder, you will sleep better. There's all kinds of benefits. I don't need to be you know, a preacher for healthy living. But sometimes you hear something that sounds so simple, you're apt to write it off. But the truth is, we don't discover profundity until we apply something, until we apply something. You know, I see people running down certain bits and pieces of advice that'll flow through the culture. You know, Jordan Peterson says, clean your room. And, you know, the intelligentsia will say, oh, what kind of advice is that? Well, you know, you won't know until you try it because its profundity is found only in application. And if you try to apply it and you find you can't do it, which is very often the case, you'll at least be put in front of a question about yourself. You'll at least learn something if you're willing to about your own limitations. So I like, I like very, very simple things. To me, very simple things can be extraordinary in application and, and only in application. Yeah, it's, a, it's funny. It's an iceberg comment, isn't it? So, because it's not just yes. society. It's, Tucker said he wanted to be more successful, so he quit drinking. So actually the thinking behind that is basically the first two miracle habits, right? Like unwavering focus and total environment. Because yes. Tucker had a goal and it, it looks like, well, I'm just not going to drink. And it is that. But it's, and it's the tidy your room thing. It's, it's that because it's an iceberg. It's all the other stuff that actually goes into making sure that you, in fact, succeed in it. So it's, I have a, a, another guest coming up, um, Carol Sanford. She's, amongst other things, a, um, a design theorist. She's got a book called Regenerative Life. And there are nodal engagements or opportunities where you can interact with a human or an organization and ha make like a small move which has outsized effects and that's she's a corporate that's consultant fascinating amongst other things right and to quit drinking and I, again i'm certainly i'm i've just put in what is it 100 um, heritage cider apple trees we are definitely not a dry farm right um <laughs> But, but in terms of like a, a, a nodal interaction in your own life, if you've got shit to do or, or whatever, um, uh, something like that or keeping, keeping your room tidy, it's, it's like a nodal interaction that will have outsized effects. And it's Absolutely. a really interesting way of kind of finding the hacks towards that, that sort of success, I guess. Yes. And you mentioned the chapter on total environment. And I, I have to credit uh, Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan and a great artist in his own right, with the phrase total environment. Anton would talk about the importance of crafting around you in your household, your workspace, your physical appearance, whatever it may be, the music you listen to, the media that you take in, so on craft around you that world which absolutely fills the i fulfills the ideal that you're reaching for you should never accept a picture a piece of furniture a piece of media in your world that isn't geared towards the satisfaction of a mind's eye ideal 
that you possess about the life you wish to live. I found this absolutely extraordinary, absolutely powerful. And Anton would say, look, you know, it's better. It's actually better for you psychically and better for you in terms of the tone of your, your character, your outlook, your personality to re reject, say, a mediocre relationship, to reject uh, an unsatisfying or an unhappy sexual relationship in favor of fantasy, in favor of self-pleasure, in favor of whatever it is you want to do and be satisfied in your own terms rather than be unhappy on terms that the world would seek to dictate to you. So I feel very strongly about that. And it, it matches up with what you were just saying about making one change and there being a kind of cascading effect of that change. The wonderful thing is you don't know what it'll be. You simply don't know what it will be. You, you may make a small change in your outer appearance, and that small change could have a, a wonderful reverberating effect that you'll never discover until you actually try it. So total environment has become a very important topic to me over the past couple of years. Mm. So when at the beginning, when I said that this book is more stringent, I, I, was, I was waiting to actually mention Anton, because I think he's the reason for, so what you've done with this book that's different is you've put him where I think he belongs in the history of American ideas, which is with these new thought types like Neville yes. Goss and Napoleon Hill and so on, right? But, and, and his version of it, although you have some, particularly when it comes to Napoleon Hill, some really stringent comments that they made as well that sounds like something Anton could say, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> and it's very, very interesting that you've kind to put him in that um that sort of yeah the zodiac of thinkers and it gives it i think a, a practical stringency total environment is is a fascinating one i remember i read satanic witch in my mid-teens i was like 14 or 15 and i found it ridiculous like the um the total mm -hmm. environment stuff but who other than a mid-teen like I was already in my total environment. Like that's the that's peak for fashion and music culture and whatever. Like the world around me was already <laughs> was already my total environment. And here's this guy telling me that you should keep old newspapers around and listen to jazz and whatever. And I'm like, no, that's insane. You're just going to be some kind of crazy shut in. But um, he was right. Like as one, yes. I aged out of being a teenager. But we in the for the membership in particular, we have a particular focus on on habitat and and how that works. In in not just the physical but spiritual right so yes. your habitat should include uh, some sort of ancestor altar and whatever and Anton's talking about that like a, a, a thriving human habitat are the things that enrich you and don't diminish you and and, yes. and what that looks like and that is a miracle habit if you and it doesn't mean like oh well let's all let's have a country pile in the welsh borders uh, it mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily i mean that would be great <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it can be a studio apartment but if this is your habitat if this is total environment take that seriously Yes, take it very seriously. And I, I appreciate that, that you mentioned grouping Anton within the New Thought lexicon. I think that's true. I define Levain Satanism as positive thinking weaponized. That's my perspective on Anton. And the truth is, you know, obviously in the social sciences, a field that's constantly shedding its skin and renouncing whatever study happened 15 minutes ago in favor of some new study. Regardless, you know, I have my citations. Uh, there's a psychologist at Harvard, still living, named Ellen Langer. And starting in the early 1980s, Langer did what I would call these total environment experiments where she took elderly folk and she placed them in settings that were very nostalgic, that evoked their, their, their youth. And she found invariably that not only were they in a better mood, but they showed better physical uh, markers and indications too after several weeks in these environments, uh, lowered blood pressure, improved uh, flexibility, uh, even in some cases improved eyesight, just a remarkable retinue of improvements just because of the effects well just i'm saying just because but we don't really know the delivery mechanism you can call it whatever you wish you know call it a morale boost use whatever psychological or characterological term you want but we don't know the delivery mechanism but we do know the results and if we're going to accept any stats at all that come out of the social sciences uh we're beholden to accept langers as well and she's done a number of studies 
where she has placed people in different environments or given them accurate information about their current environments, information that, that may weigh positively upon their health, like telling hotel maids, tough job, telling hotel maids that their labor does have aerobic and anaerobic benefit, which it does. And seeing that hotel maids versus a control group demonstrate uh, weight loss, greater muscle tone, greater flexibility. Again, we are experiencing concrete, measurable physical results all the time based on our experience of our environment, including information that we receive about our environment. So th this stuff, it seems to me, has concrete benefits. Oh, absolutely. Um, and there's another person, not, not exactly new thought, but certainly weird and remarkable, um, David Lynch, who said, for instance, workshop surroundings keep you younger. And, and I, yes, don't think that's, question. I don't think that's just a Lynchianism. I think that I think if someone did a, uh, another social science experiment on that, I, I'm highly confident that that would be a similar kind of true to the studies you just mentioned. Yes. And, you know, one of the things I had the I had the uh, benefit to work with David several years ago on a book of his called Catching the Big Fish. And one of the things he talked about in that book, which I make reference to in The Miracle Habits, is the benefits, as you were just saying, of a workshop atmosphere. It, keeps, it not only keeps you younger, but it guarantees that you're going to get things done that would be impossible to you if you didn't have a workshop atmosphere. So he talks about the idea of the painter must have – his or her paints, canvases, right there, ready to go. You have to be able to work. And I realize, I have two children. I realize for some people how difficult and how distant a thing that is. There are some people who are caregivers, who are parents, who are dealing with health issues. They simply cannot have a workshop environment that they're ready. And I would say, I understand that and I relate to that, but keep it as an ideal and take whatever small steps you can to move in that direction. Even a small step, as we've been discussing, within an environment can change everything if it's done in a committed way. And if you do have the freedom to have a workshop environment, exercise it, exercise it absolutely. And, you know, I think one of the things I learned from David, and he can be very tough-minded about this, and there's no sense in flinching from reality that a person who's an artist, who's a writer, who's an entrepreneur, who's a business owner, they have to be on all the time. They just have to be on all the time. And there is a certain degree of absolutely self-centered, self-focused energy that must be expended if you're going to succeed in your art, your business, whatever it is that you're doing. It's a solitary endeavor. And I, I, I certainly don't think that we can neglect our relationships, but I, I, I don't see how you can move through life accomplishing things as an artist or an entrepreneur without really coming to grips with how much solitary time you absolutely have to expend. And that may mean not having time for other people sometimes. There's no sense in fleeing from that. But I also always say that one well-selected aim can cover a lot of different bases. You might come into benefits that allow you to help people you love in ways that you otherwise wouldn't. But in any case, Everyone you regard as a hero, everyone you wish to emulate, whoever that person may be, whether an artist, an inventor, a diplomatic figure, whatever it is, almost always that person was known for one absolute wish or aim in his or her life. That's habit one, which is unwavering focus. And it can seem, it can seem selfish, and I don't want to run away from that. But at the same time, again, I would say that one well-selected aim, whatever it may be, can cover a lot of different bases. But without that, without that, you disperse your energies, without concentration, without focus, without drilling down into that one absolute thing. It's the closest thing we're given to a kind of a magic key or a magic elixir in life. And I would urge against neglecting it. Yeah, absolutely. I want to get to, I really enjoyed, it's it's a false dichotomy um, to set singularity of focus against a, a kind of off-the-shelf societal morality. You know, would you, I yes. just talk about that, but the um, going back to the workshop surroundings, because I had uh, occasion to think about it as I was reading through the book, uh, I have a home office here now, obviously. And what I have learned through the last few months of house arrest is, and it's, it's back to workshops, I 
when it's in the almost like first draft phase of writing, I need to be alone around other people. So mm -hmm. when I wrote my first couple of books in London, there were a couple of old timey Soho cafes that I I'd get into Soho uh, before work um, at about seven in the morning. And I, that would give me two hours in a cafe um, to write. And that was my workshop. That because I was in a share house in <laughs> West London mm -hmm. otherwise. And that is like, work, there's workshop in the sense of if you are, um, a painter like David Lynch, you need, you can't really do that in a cafe, but there are a lot of things that if you, if you widen out coming back to the sort of total environment or sovereignty over how you live your life, there are examples of that. And I have struggled in the past few months because part of my process involves, in this case, it would either be going to Hobart or, or back to the mainland to some larger cities and spending a few days there working in cafes and pubs and, and so on as part of the process, which I obviously haven't been able to do. But it, when that workshops keep you younger and prioritize, even if you live with kids in a small apartment or whatever, you know in your head what places will will assist in that kind of unwavering focus and one day you will get to like um having your painting garret in the pyrenees for sure like that's fine but you, you kind of know what it is now anyway like we have stories of, of the great writers of the last 300 years doing things like writing novels on trains because they worked for the trains like you know you can it, oh absolutely <clears throat> and i have i have been there and i can attest to that i mean i have written under every circumstance imaginable i remember i would literally i mentioned this in the book and it's the truth i've been to concerts and I've, I've had my computer with me so that I could write before the band or the performer came out. And I, I tell you, Gordon, there's not a single place on earth that I, I haven't stopped to write, to get down a paragraph, to not be lost without uh, devices when an idea comes to me. It's, it's absolutely critical. It's absolutely vital. The artist has to be working and he or she has to be working all the time. And I'm sure the same is true of an entrepreneur. I'm not an entrepreneur, but I think people who start businesses uh, can totally relate to this. Yeah, and that will that leads us to, I think, unwavering focus. I, I really like that the book, I mean, I like the book, but I really like that the book opens strong with unwavering focus. Um, and, and it's not, you don't give people, you don't sort of pussyfoot around it. It's like, listen. <laughs> yeah. This, and this is the stringency that I think is very now because we're heading into, no one who is alive today um, has any experience with the kind of economic devastation we're going to live through in the next five years. Yes. So, yes. Um, that is a cause to lean into unwavering focus, not to have it waver. Like, it's absolutely now or never. I, I, I very much agree. And I also counsel people that you don't need to justify or reprocess your wish, your aim through some uh, off the shelf morality that society or the spiritual culture for that matter tries to enforce upon us. Uh, too often in new thought, I find that people, and, and this is true throughout the spiritual culture in general, they try to twist themselves into knots to explain how their wish, their focus, whatever they want to accomplish in the world is going to be of service to other people. I don't think that that's necessary. I think that the creative act, the act of self-generativity, the productive act is justification alone of itself, in and of itself. If, if a person reads scripture, and uh, you'll find in Western scripture, God created man in his own image. You'll find in Hermeticism, as above, so below. You'll find some variant of this repeating in ethical or spiritual philosophies throughout the world. The exercise of one's faculties seems as close to uh, anything I can arrive at as the purpose of life. If you are a generative being, then then go forth and and be so, and don't try to adjust or retrofit or or gussy up whatever it is you're trying to accomplish through some tones of morality that you think is going to please unseen forces or you think is going to please some some. Uh, internalized peer pressure that you have in your head. I haven't the slightest idea how or whether my work is going to help another individual. I, 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 I hope that it will. It's my intention to try to tell the truth as much as I've been 
capable of arriving at it, but the notion that I can somehow predict or foresee how what I do is exactly going to be of service to somebody else or whether it will be of service, I think it's just asking too much of myself. What I do know is that I was unhappy before in life when I was not writing and speaking and in front of cameras and microphones, and I am happy now in life that I am doing all of those things. And that transformation has been absolutely revolutionary for me. And again, I can't imagine my life is exceptional. So I, I take that very seriously. And I don't want people, especially those of us who come out of the New Thought tradition, as I do, to feel pressured by having to box themselves into some sort of service category. I don't believe you have to do that. I think being self-expressive is it's life itself. It's simply life itself. I, I, if we're here to be generative and if we're here to be productive, then that act in itself is defining of what it means to use your physical and mental and ethical faculties. Go and use them. You don't have to add something to it. Don't add any justification to it. No, absolutely. I mean, there's the um, the quotation around that in the book is your aim should be expressive of your nature in as much as a cat hunts nocturnally, a bird rides a yes. hunts, or a bee gathers pollen. That that was one of my um, sort of ayahuasca experiences in the in the jungle was the sense of um, humans are here to do humaning, and and it's yes. we don't and it's uh, we'll, we'll talk about this. I think there's a Levian influence here as well, where there's a sort of uh, flipping the script or flipping the tables on the um, on the default idea that you you must publicly express like you you came to Earth to Mitch Horowitz, not clean chamber pots in a workhouse. Like yes, it's, it's not like the default thing, and it's in fact a violation of almost like the the cosmic reason, if you will, for for why you're here to to corral that into something. Uh, that it isn't. And I like that you sort of put that people who will suggest that maybe you're, you're too fixated on your own goal. Um, they ha that, that if they say that it's hiding a subtle dishonesty, I think for your words. I, I, I believe that that's so, you know, I think that the wish to be self-expressive requires no justification and to pretend that there's some division between our careers, our relationships, our financial lives, and that which we call life in its most basic sense, I think is just artifice. It's just complete artifice. I think there are many people walking around within lettered culture who have never appreciated, for example, what a wonderful act of self-realization it is to start a business and how much that means in the life of the individual who does that and so on and so forth throughout all of life, whatever it is you want to accomplish, you know, whether you're rising up through the ranks in the military, whether you uh, have some, some, some goal, you know, in terms of athletics or in terms of finance or anything else in your life, there's no inner and outer. I, I don't believe ultimately speaking, there's any higher and lower. Where would one begin and one end? These things are all artifice based on consensus definitions. The notion that 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 the the show me attachment and non attachment you know show me identification and non identification i can't wrap my arms around these things any more than i can around terms like ego and super ego you know these are all just these very general terms that that we kind of use to enforce parameters around one another and at least give yourself the benefit of saying i don't know if any of this stuff is real at all i don't know if any of this is true at all and don't cite chapter and verse to me of spiritual literature that it comes from, because frankly, that literature mostly was written thousands of years ago, dealing with human situations, dealing with cultures, dealing with the concerns of people who lived in very particular circumstances, very particular worlds, have very particular survival needs that may not necessarily reflect my own or your own today. And most of the people who are quoting these things can't even speak the original languages in which they were written. These are translations of translations of translations. And so I'd much rather rely upon self-verification than I would upon somebody quoting something to me that he or she thinks is from a bit of Vedic literature that, that may not only address the survival needs of people that, who, who, who had needs that were very particular and may not necessarily match up with my own 
in this time and place, but who may have expressed themselves very, very differently than I really believe. I remember when my book, One Simple Idea, was being translated into Chinese, which the Chinese government was kind enough to censor about one third of, but nonetheless, the book did come out there uh, in a sort of way. I was working with a translator in Shanghai, and uh, there were concepts, like certain Buddhist concepts that we in the West have, and I was trying to explain these Buddhist concepts to her from my perspective. And at a certain point, she would just laugh because she came from a culture, I think she probably would have considered herself an atheist, but she came from a culture where you'll find Buddhist ideas, sometimes talked about, if not necessarily publicly professed. And her perspective on these things was very, very different from my own. But then again, I've never lived in a, in a society from which Vedic or Buddhist ideas are rooted or in the languages in which these things are rooted. So we have to be real careful of thinking how much we know about what ancient people or traditional cultures were thinking about, because we don't have as firm a grasp as we believe. And I don't think we should allow quotations to uh, trump or get in the way of self-verification. Yeah, it's funny that I, I enjoyed the subtle dishonesty thing. It's sort of like the people who gossip the most uh, invariably seem to be the least successful. If people have, and and if people talk out the side of their mouths about um, service and 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 what you oh. should do with life or privilege, you go. This is you can see immediately that what what's actually happening is they haven't done the the internal desire work for themselves, right? Like, and that's, yes. and, and it's important for people who are listening to this going unwavering focus, this is my jam, to realize that the, you could almost allocate, and I can only say this for spiritual reasons, or something Crowley would say or whatever, you can almost sideline that sort of, well, what about helping people along with the, the gossip of the peanut gallery? Because yes. invariably the people who are drawn to this sort of work don't sort of wake up one morning and say, I think I'm called to open a cadmium enrichment facility in the Amazon. <laughs> like, <laughs> You'll find that if you're following your purpose, it's actually a thing that the universe is called to do. <laughs> yes, yes, it's necessary. Right, right. You know, it's funny. Uh, I, I have an article up on Medium called How It Feels to Be Blacklisted. And uh, it's about my experience of having been kicked out of a New Age organization, which severed all public ties with me after I'd delivered a lecture on Satanism here in New York City, and it made the rounds on YouTube, and this was considered all too scandalous for them, so I had to be kicked out. And I remember shortly before I was kicked out, I was there for a weekend conference. Everything went well. Everybody was very nice to my face. And everybody who came up to me wanted to talk to me about love, service, and justice. And all the people who wanted to talk to me about love and service were the ones who hit me with a two-by-four as soon as I was out the door. So, you know, I sort of have a bit of a hardened attitude about what might happen uh, when people start talking to you about love, service, and justice. The Talmud puts it this way, beware the man who bespeaks his own virtues. I've never seen life contradict that statement. Yeah, that one's good. That one, I like that one. One of the other, um, I guess when it comes to mobilizing unwavering focus, there's a really, really interesting, and again, this hit home for me over the last couple of years because I've never owned property before we moved down here, <clears throat> which is like how to spend money is in this mm. book. And uh, I mean, talk us through that because I, it, as, as I went through that part of the book, I'm like, this is something I've been doing. I've been in an interesting situation, obviously, with what's going on in the world where, um, and it, what's going to look like inevitable property crashes in places like New York. It's the opposite somewhere like here. And, and especially mm -hmm. we, you know, um, move further and further in that permaculture sense towards, uh, we're not going to be self-sufficient, but like uh, increasing, I guess, food reliability or what have you. All these things yeah. we're doing, which uh, come at a considerable investment, are in sort of fall into this idea of um, spending money in in a correct way. Talk us through that. Yes, it's very interesting, and I I, I had to really revisit that chapter several times uh, with absolute realism because it was being written while the economic lockdown and the COVID crisis was unfolding and I was watching the whole world shut down. And as you've alluded, we ain't even in the rapids yet. And when we get to the rapids, boy, that's going to be something. But 
what I what I came to is this, and this is based partly on my reading of of, of Ralph Walter Emerson, who I think wrote a lot of good essays on commerce and wealth. First of all, when you spend, it's vitally, vitally important that you try your very best to spend your money in ways that are going to improve your ability to earn more of it or to be productive in some other way. You know, if you're spending your money on um, structures, on agriculture, on vital and necessary technology, on, on career skills, on education, bravo, bravo. You've got it. You've got it. You're on the right track. And more difficult is when we're induced to spend our money on entertainment and escapism. And some of that is necessary in every life. I mean, we have to wind down. You know, after Noah struck ground in his ark, we're told he planted a vineyard and got drunk. So we're all Noah. You know, we have to wind down in one way or another. And I wrestle with that in New York City because there's a lot of ways to piss away your money in New York City, as there is in other large cities. And most of them have to do with eating out, going to bars if they're open and things of that nature. But the idea, Emerson's ideal of spending was that you should only spend uh, 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 when it's going to increase your productivity or increase your ability to earn. And Emerson would say, look, you know, we all want to satisfy animal pleasures, but how many animal pleasures can you satisfy over and over again in the course of a single life? Uh, only spend your money in ways that are going to improve your, your productivity. And of course we have to meet some baseline need in life in order to earn money in order to earn our living we have to be satisfying some baseline need and that's a very personal question for every individual i also had to add a section and i'm going to talk about this more in the future that although i really countenance responsibility when it comes to finance saving money paying down debt so on and so forth when there's an economic crisis afoot you have to maintain liquidity you have to maintain liquidity. And I've broken some of my own rules. I'm usually very conservative about paying down debt and setting aside money for savings. And I've benefited from those things tremendously. But during COVID and during this lockdown, liquidity is king. And you just, you have to maintain liquid cash on hand and you have to do what you need to do in order to maintain that cash. And one other thing uh, that, that I would add to this, which I think is, is important for people to understand, is that we may very well find ourselves in a position over the ensuing months where we're going to have to make some very, very tough decisions about what we're willing to spend our money on and what we, we're capable of spending our money on. And those decisions are very intimate. Those decisions are very personal. I'm not saying that you should just take this go it alone approach and go nuts, but I'm, I'm saying very seriously that middle-class parents here in America and in other parts of the world have got to ask themselves very tough questions about universities and colleges. Oh, yeah. I think a great deal of college education is a scam, especially in the humanities and the social sciences. I understand that a person might need to go to a trade school, might need to go to a nursing school, or, you know, gain certain degrees for engineering or the medical professions and bravo i'm the first in line to say that's wonderful but 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 once you get beyond that i think you better be really really careful because i think that money can be spent in other ways and uh, colleges have worked i hate to say things in such a blunt way because i know there's good people on college campuses i know there's good faculty people but i think colleges have worked a huge scam on us and we have to be real careful and I ask everybody to think independently. Absolutely. I enjoyed that. It, um, it was in Chaos Protocols before all this happened because that came out in whatever it was, 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. But like, if, if you're from, if you're, if you're a Vanderbilt, go to an Ivy League, right? Um, <laughs> right. Like if the family's paying for it, go for your life. If not, get yeah. the cheapest fucking community college education for a, a, a thing like a, a humanities that you possibly can because it's a scam and I wouldn't want to be them at the moment. Yale at the moment is trying to charge Yale fees for Zoom calls. Crazy. Get the fuck out. <laughs> Oh it's my God. <laughs> fucking outrageous. It's horrible. And these institutions are very wealthy. Harvard probably has a larger endowment than, you know, most nations in the third world. Yep. I mean, and that's no joke. You know, I mean, these places are trafficking in, in, uh, 
I mean, hundreds of millions and sometimes billions of dollars. Uh, NYU and Columbia University here in New York City are among the biggest real estate owners in town. They put the Kushner family to shame. And so these places are working a terrible scam, and I really want people to think independently about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wouldn't want to be... I wouldn't want to be Yale or whatever at the moment, because despite the endowments, um, which, and the Harvard one is like, if you want to know what, um, what the rulers of the world have planning, uh, have planned, follow the, the little bits of information we can get about where um, Harvard endowment gets invested. But yes, um, yes. But yeah, I wouldn't Good want to be them at the moment. I wouldn't want to yeah. be. <laughs> yeah, we're we're all going to have to think very independently about all of this, and it's 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 not going to be easy. But at the same time, it can also be extremely liberating. And and I I want people to really think very very freely about this. You don't don't isolate yourself. Don't make rash decisions necessarily, but but. Put everything on the table because we're spending money in ways that we have been conditioned to spend it, and it's not absolutely necessary. No, and it it it. I love this bit because it connects to the vitality chapter and the unwavering focus chapter. So, when you look at what only spend things that expand your power, you don't need to be on a permaculture farm in Tasmania looking at like um, solar powered poultry netting for that to be true. You just need yes. to be in the supermarket looking at the Doritos that are Mountain Dew flavored and going, should I be eating this? Or should I be eating, should I be eating like low carb, high protein um, vegetables? Like that yes. is a purchase that will expand your power. So there's no, yes. there's no situation where your understanding of, of money in pursuit of these unwavering goals doesn't come into play. You know the things that you should, so for instance, a novel, I would consider an expansion of power as long as you're not, which I sometimes am to be fair, a compulsive purchaser of them. Mm -hmm. um, like fiction and, and story and whatever I would consider to be an essential part of expanding power. You know damn well, Mountain Dew flavored Doritos are not that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And also in terms of reciprocity, I would say to people, Pay people on time, honor the people who you're paying, whether it's a contractor, whether it's a service provider, whatever it is. Every artist who's listening to these words right now, or every freelancer who's listening to these words right now knows the experience of having to chase down money, whether it's royalties or whatever it is, and how many media companies don't make the ethical connection that the individual is, is living off this money. This is his or her livelihood. So, if you realize that, and it's important to realize that, you, you know how much goodwill and how much ethical solidity you're bringing into the world in a very concrete way if you pay people quickly, whomever it is, pay them quickly and forget all about words like service, you know, forget all about words like compassion. Uh, nobody needs your hugs, your service, your empathy, your compassion. They need they need your, your personal policies of, of, of honor and decency and nobility. And usually, let's be frank, that involves money. Time and money are the commodities that we're capable of giving other people. Everything else is, starts to get kind of squishy and imaginary. Pay people quickly. If you want to perform an act of service, start with that as an act of service. But don't use the word service. You know, use nobility, use dignity, use loyalty, use whatever you want. But but don't get lost in those words because I think they allow us to dodge who we really are in the world. They allow too much imagination of the wrong kind to enter our lives. Pay on time. That's enough. Yeah, I like it. The final bit that I think makes it, um, or the final section I wanted to chat to you about that comes out of the habits is – it's almost like total environment includes your physical form in this. So all of these things we're talking about focus and, and comporting with a sense of honor and, and using and only spending that expands power. It's all of that stuff needs a, uh, needs a coherence that also serves the whole. And what I yes. really like about this one, it's in some of the other books too, but I really like that it's a quotation from the book, but change your conception of yourself and you'll automatically change the world in which you live. And there's there's a part of it that I think people, uh, and, and everyone should, you know, in the bella figura sense, try and you know, look their best, but it's more than that. Like this is this is like real ritual magic, isn't it? Yes, I feel very strongly that the manner in which we dress, the manner in which we comport ourselves is something that we all pay attention to, we all care about, but it's too easy 
within our current spiritual culture to overtly write that stuff off as as vanity or self-indulgence it's nothing of the sort again i think this idea that there's some separation between inner and outer is artifice some separation between what we might call essence and personality is absolutely artifice where would be the lines of demarcation in any case change one thing in a sincere sustained way and you change everything it's all one thing it's all one thing we're told change begins within well i don't know that that's necessarily true i've experienced wonderful change in my life that has actually begun without and that has reverberated begin change just is it just is and if you can change something about your outer appearance maybe the way you choose to dress in some way something you would like to do whatever it is bodily adornments you name it, you know, that small change, that seemingly small change can have a a, a remarkable effect, which you won't know until you actually enact it. And even if you identify a change you'd like to make in your outer appearance, and for whatever reason, you're incapable or you feel incapable of making that change, maybe because maybe you have a workplace that demands a certain dress code, although most workplaces unfortunately are closed right now, at least know what the preference is know what the preference is, know that something in your life is keeping you from comporting yourself the way you want to and see what that information does for you. I really want people to get away from this idea that there's such thing as inner, outer, higher, lower, spiritual, material, uh, temporal, eternal. I think all these things are just the vaguest off the shelf words, throw them out, forget about them. And, and, and you may find that suddenly your life feels more dynamic. Your life feels more, more self-directed. You feel a greater sense of, of self nobility, direction, ability, capacity, respect, because suddenly you're working on things that maybe therapeutic or spiritual authorities have told you were unspiritual or, or, or are, are misdirected away from the actual of life. It's all the actual and, and there's absolutely no limits on you. And you know what it's going to be too. Like if you're listening to this and you're like, well, I want to cut my hair super short and dye it red. Like, you know what it is. <laughs> and it's that it's the authentic or, or whatever. These are such um, fraught terms, but it's part of you coming to earth to do a thing is to, is to express it in that way. It's, it's funny. It's sort of like, you know what it is, you know, how, you know, the direction you're supposed to be going. And it's like, I'd really like to wear that or, or whatever it happens. I'd like that tattoo or whatever it happens to be. Yes. You know yes. what it is. Right. And don't dismiss it. You know, don't dismiss it. I mean, as we were talking about apropos of Tucker Carlson's statement, small things can contain incredible truth that one realizes only an application. So, don't don't brush off anything. It could be that small thing is 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 just a wonderful fulcrum in your life. I mean that with all seriousness. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Mr. Horowitz, um, once again, congratulations on the book. I've um, I kept you. you for kept you for an hour, and it's uh, it's excellent. Um, oh, by the way, you. I wanted to mention this. Um, because the book closes with a Guggenheim anecdote. And um, so I was, I was finishing up the book. So, someone you may recognize. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Because yeah. So, I yeah. live down here, so I had it pre-ordered on Kindle. So I uh-huh. took a screenshot, or I took a phone photo of my laptop reading the book and sent it, yeah. where I'm allowed to use his name, and sent it to Troy. Um, yes. The story about Troy successfully, you, you, this is the bit you don't know, and I'm, I get to explain it to you. What you were unaware of in February, the Guggenheim, was that he was doing the 10-day Miracle Challenge. It was part of the Wealth Magic course we were doing. But his mm-hmm. goal was a um, farmhouse in, in Normandy, which he's in the process of buying. Absolutely so, remarkable. I did yeah. not know that. Thank there you. There you go. So you, Thank you. Like, the, the book finishes with uh, yet another successful, because a whole bunch of the premium members did it, and we have a whole bunch of great stories of people who are like, wow. <laughs> I'm touched to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I'm touched the 10 to hear day that. One. And so Troy says hi, and that the right. challenge he told you about is in fact in the process of coming off. That's brilliant. Uh, I'm, I'm filled with joy to hear that. I did not know that. Thank you. That's nice. wonderful to hear. Yeah. All right. So for people who want to know more and where they can find you online and, and all the rest of us, lay that, lay that out. Uh, my website is MitchHorowitz.com. Uh, I'm more up to date, though, at Twitter, at Mitch Horowitz, Instagram, at Mitch Horowitz 23 And I'm posting there all the time. So if you want to know about talks or books or articles, so that's a good way to stay current with me.
Nice one. And that, and of course, links to the book will be in the show notes. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Always enjoy it, Gordon. Thank you. Great stuff as ever. And like I said to Mitch during the show, this book feels especially timely. Miracles are obviously always welcome, but with what's coming up, they're going to be essential. And I'll give you, I guess, a personal example of how one of the habits became just that little bit extra, I guess, uh, at the moment. So at the beginning of the year, during the Wealth Magic course, we were talking about goal setting on a personal and professional basis. Now, one of the podcasts I listen to regularly is The Creative Pen. It's a show about indie publishing by a British author named Joanna Penn. And at the end of last year, or the beginning of this year, one or the other, she had a show about goal setting where she made her she made health her main business goal for 2019 and the show was about reviewing how well she'd done with that and so on and there was something about that framing that really resonated with me. So Joanna has certainly more experience being uh, self-employed than I do and she's older than me. So it was useful to hear it described that way. And, and I guess like, whilst it's true for all forms of employment, it's especially true for the self-employed because that work-life balance thing is a stranger course to chart, I guess. And, and nested inside that as a business goal is a wider philosophical position around what your life is for and what money is for and all that kind of thing, right? So as in, what's the point of ruining your health working really hard only to die without enjoying the fruits of it, like, you know, or die without enjoying retirement or something. And it, if you frame it that way, when you, when you make health a business goal and look at it from a business perspective, for a lot of people, and that was certainly the case for me, uh, it, it just becomes a bit clearer, right? And so my modification of, of Joanna's goal being health was to make vitality my main business goal for 2020 because it includes Joanna's physical health component, but also encompasses regular meditation and whatever you want to call energy work and being on country and, and all that sort of stuff, right? So it just seemed like a, um, a more magically situated way of saying something very similar. So vitality is one of the miracle habits Mitch lists in his book. And it's just the best example of now more than ever, right? Like, so my gym only reopened last week. So for the past five months, um, my goal, my business goal of vitality has been that much harder, but harder in the sense that it's also become more urgent. So these aren't the sort of business goals you can put off to next year because the market conditions change, right? So it's not like opening up five new sales teams across the country, but then it turns out, no, that's not a good idea. We'll move it into 2022. It's a, it's a goal that becomes more urgent rather than less as the conditions become more extreme, right? And I use the word stringent on the show a few times, and it's because the miracle habits are that kind of stringent where you they become more extreme as the conditions do, I guess. And it's almost like they're not optional. You, you kind of want to call them miracle commandments or something. But see, even that doesn't quite work because at least how I read them, I'm not even sure they should be plural. Uh, there's... There's a coherence to the habits that means that, sure, like one or two of them will uh, likely improve your life just on their own, particularly getting away from toxic people. Uh, if you just implement them, your life will be better. Um, but get them all rowing in the right direction, and then you're in miracle country. Anyway, it's another great book from Mitch. Uh, if you're looking for something to read that will also read you a little bit to filth, um, while still allowing you to rediscover excitement about your future, uh, then this one is a good one. Details, of course, in the show notes. Until next time. Bye.